a time when it's more mild, when it hasn't yet increased in greater intensity, and you notice some of the features here, fines, imprisonment, inducements to try to persuade people. Desire of Ages, pages 121, 122, uh, also uh, helps us to see this pattern. Notice, in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. So, so there's that same idea. Starts not as intensely serious as it gets as time passes. But there's another interesting aspect in which the National Sunday Law, we've been shown in inspiration, starts uh, smaller and grows and gets bigger. And this has to do with uh, geography. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 18. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. And what I find so interesting about this is it tells us sort of the path it's going to take globally. Isn't that remarkable? And that's not the only statement. Take a look at this one. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world, from page 395 in uh, volume 6 of the Testimonies. So we're going to put this development up here, this increasing Sunday legislation, which starts mild and gets more and more serious uh, and starts somewhat localized and becomes international, becomes global. Um, I put this picture here because I... I'm always going to forget to, to insert this thought if I don't have that picture. <laughs> this is our garden a year ago. Um, and the only thing I should really say about that picture of that garden is that we didn't plant most of that stuff. <laughs> we had a gardening seminar at our house, and people kidded me that actually I just did that so that someone would come plant my garden for me. And that did work nicely. <laughs> um, we had about 35 people show up for a week. And um, we had a great time with Brad Neely, who was our master gardener that we brought in to do this. And I, I did try and plant a few things, but it was sort of, everybody was clamoring for seeds, you know, and I just, uh, I, I didn't want to get in the way. But I did plant a few things. But uh, the reason I have this here is because uh, this brings us to a very interesting point. If we go back to this period of time, the little time of trouble... Um, and I think it's important because I think it's very much misunderstood. That's going to be seen by God's people that having a place in the country and growing your own food will be most keenly appreciated during this time right here. Um, because keep in mind, there's been all kinds of devastation and disaster. There is, an, there is increasing problems with buying and selling and those who are positioned to have a store of food will be at a great advantage. Now, I understand that part of uh, the reason that people are confused about this is because of a misuse of a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, which says that it is contrary to Bible religion to make provisions for the time of trouble. But here's where we have to apply that rule that has always kept us on the straight path, and that is precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You take everything you can find on a subject, and it helps you understand something. Um, one of the first things that I discovered as I, I was pondering this statement is that this statement about not making provisions for the time of trouble came from a lady who herself, talking about Mrs. White, in her own household would can hundreds of quarts of fruit every year. I mean, there's accounts of 800 quarts of fruit I read a letter where she, now she had help doing that, ladies, you know, it wasn't all by herself. That's a lot of canning, isn't it? Um, there's, there's a letter that I, that I read where she wrote to someone, and it was right at the time that they were picking prunes uh, from the tree, the plums, whatever, they're going to turn into prunes, and she wrote to a friend saying, I still have some of last year's prunes. If I could find a way to get these to you, I would. Uh, so I take that to mean that she had a year's supply of prunes. Because <laughs> still, the next year when they're coming off the tree, she's still got plenty and she's wanting to share them with people. 
So how does this work? I mean, this is the same person who said, don't make provisions for the time of trouble. Well, this is another reason why we looked at that clarifying statement about the two times of trouble, right? Because after this, we get into the great time of trouble. That's when the plagues are. That's after the close of probation. Um, We're going to see some other things that happen during this time period. But remember, she clarified that there are two times of trouble, and it's appropriate to call it the time of trouble either way, but you need to understand which time you're talking about. And um, here are the clues. In fact, if you want to look at the other statement, I don't have it on a slide, but it's in Last Day Events, page 264, the statement I just referred to about not making provision for the time of trouble. She says some things about it specifically. She says that those who have food laid up or in the field will run into problems because it will be taken from them by violent hands and strangers will reap the fields. Now, how is it that I know that that's talking about the great time of trouble and not the little time of trouble? Here's how I know, because inspiration has told us. Notice this statement. Adventist Home, page 141. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country. Now, notice this, where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future... The problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Which period of time is she talking about when she talks about the problem of buying and selling? That's the little time of trouble when the National Sunday Law issue is increasing. And she's saying that it would be good to have provisions. It would good to be able to be good to be able to grow our own provisions during that time. The statement where she said it's contrary to Bible religion to make provisions for the time of trouble, she says that those things in the field will be taken by violent hands. Apparently that's not the case here because she says that it's to our advantage to have produce that we're growing. So you see, once again, by comparing enough of what we can find on a topic, it's clarified for us what the Lord is trying to tell us. I want to go ahead and finish reading this. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. Now, usually when when I talk about this, somebody always says, well, what are you going to do when people from the nearest town or whatever find out you have food and they show up on your property? That's easy. I'm going to give them some food, (laughs) right? Because do you suppose that, that someone who comes to me for food and they find out, or you, they find out you've prepared, they might want to know what else you know that caused you to be so prepared for the future. Are you with me? So this is just one of those important aspects of very practical preparation that God's people should be about. All right, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about this little time of trouble, and then we'll move on to the last section there. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold... He's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. From Matthew 24, verses 23 to 26. This is a prophecy about what uh, Mrs. White referred to as uh, a great masterpiece of deception. We're talking about the devil's sort of final great delusion when he comes and personates Christ. And that's described in detail here. We'll read it. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. And that's in chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him. 
while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them, as Christ blessed his disciples 